Watching Gears. Brought to you by LMC Truck. Restore, maintain, customize. You know, the more you get into building cars and trucks, the more you're going to find that some projects are just easier than others. I mean, sometimes it's just a matter of taking things off and bolting on some new parts. Other times, it involves major surgery. But the one key element that you're going to have to have, no matter what you're working on, is you've got to be able to solve problems because they're going to come up. And sometimes there's no products out there that can help you. You're on your own. A prime example of that sort of project is Sergeant Rock. This is a 1941 Dodge Power Wagon, and as you can see, it has a direct tie-in to the legendary bomber of World War II, the Memphis Belle. And that is just awesome. But that also brings up some issues. Number one, the rarity of the vehicle, and number two, the direction that I went with it means that there is nothing that you're going to be able to get that's just going to bolt on and be right. No, you're going to have to modify everything. So you're not only designing a vehicle, but you're also hand making pretty much everything on it, which means this is a very time consuming project, but it's also the most rewarding and something every one of you guys can do if you take your time and you approach it right. So what we're going to do today is jump back on this project and show you how to solve some of those problems that's going to come up on your project. Now, one of the biggest things that we get questions about is how to retrofit a different engine into your project and make it work. Now, it doesn't really matter if you're putting a diesel into a Jeep or a, a big block into a Chevette. I mean, that doesn't matter. An engine swap is all about pre-planning and having all the components that you need so you can properly lay it out. So, we're going to get our engine all prepped up and ready to go into the big boy. All right, as a reminder, this is a 605 cubic inch, all aluminum, big block Mopar from Indy Cylinder Heads, kicking out 850 horsepower on pump gas. Yeah, this is a bad boy. But it's not going in the truck looking just like this. No, it needs a water pump and some accessories on here so it'll run. The problem is, accessories can cause some serious clearance issues up at the radiator and the frame rails. So they have got to be part of the pre-fitting process. Don't leave this to chance. Now, the system that we're using comes from March Performance, and it's called the Revolver System, which is kind of fitting since it's going in a vehicle with twin 50 caliber machine guns on it. Take a look at this. You've got a polished aluminum water pump, a new power steering pump, a chrome alternator, and a chrome air conditioning compressor, and then, of course, all the polished pulleys to go with this, and then the polished brackets and hardware to put it all together. Now, the cool thing about using the system for March Performance is that all these pulleys and all these brackets are all polished and clear-coated, so you're not polishing aluminum all the time trying to make it look good. You just hose it down and wipe them off, and they look awesome. The other cool thing about this system is how easy it goes on. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The water pump is first, and it just slides over the supplied studs, followed by the inner brackets, the threaded spacers, and finished off with the main faceplate. Now, believe it or not, everything else mounts right off of that main bracket, starting with this air conditioning compressor. The alternator goes on the other side. The power steering pump goes below that. And then the four idler pulleys go in the center. We'll follow that with the rest of the pulleys and you have a modern state-of-the-art accessory system that is perfect for a tight engine compartment. Now, I know you're probably wondering about this artwork on the firewall. Well, that was done by airbrush artist Cliff Daigle, and initially all I wanted was Sergeant Rock done as a World War II Dodge Ram, because the Power Wagon is the earliest type of Dodge Ram pickup. But I didn't want much, because I knew I was going to have to modify this firewall, 
when I put the engine in. Well, Cliff got going, as you can see. Now he's got a cigar in his teeth and he's doing his best Arnold Schwarzenegger and he's mowing somebody down with a 50 caliber machine gun. The Memphis Bell is flying over at night. This is a great piece of artwork. The challenge now for me is to not cut too much of this away when I put the engine in because this is cool stuff. You know, the day after the automobile was invented, the automotive aftermarket was born because somebody tried to put a bigger engine in that car, I guarantee you. It's been going on since the very beginning. And as you probably guessed, there are some tricks to putting an engine and drivetrain into a vehicle that they were never intended to be in. And that is what we're showing you today with Sergeant Rock. Okay, when you go to fit an engine in a project, you're gonna face some clearance issues in the back, in the front, on top and bottom, and on both sides. So we're gonna deal with the front to back first. Now, as you can see, we have already recessed this firewall four inches here, and I've got the engine pushed back to where there's about an inch of clearance between the engine and the firewall, and that's perfect. You don't want it any closer. So we've got the engine back as far as it's gonna go. Now in front, if you're gonna mount a mechanical fan like this that bolts to the front of the engine, you need to make sure you've got at least two inches of clearance between the leading edge of the fan and the radiator, especially with the 4x4, because you'll get out and start four-wheeling, you'll start flexing that frame, and that fan will go right into the radiator and destroy it. So, you need to make sure you're leaving clearance for that. Now, unfortunately, a mechanical fan doesn't work on most custom applications, so if you're gonna use an electric like we are, you have the choice of mounting it as a puller fan on the inside of the radiator, or as a pusher fan on the outside of the radiator. Now, if you're gonna mount it as a puller, you need to make sure you've got at least an inch of clearance between the fan motor and the water pump snout with this mounted to the radiator and the radiator in place. Now, as you can see, we do not have the room to do that. So, my only choices are to recess the firewall another three inches, no, we ain't gonna do that, or mount this as a pusher on the outside of the radiator. The good news back here in the back is it looks like the bell housing for the transmission is gonna just barely clear the firewall, so we may not have to trim it at all. Oh, man. All right. For your clearances top and bottom, you need to make sure you have clearance around your oil pan so you're not hitting a cross member or something like that. Now, if you'll notice on this project, that's not gonna be a problem because we've got all kinds of room in here. Up on top, it's the same thing. Got plenty of room for an air filter and it's still gonna clear the hood with no problem. So we're all right there. Up here in front is where we got a little bit of an issue. Check this out. Notice when I try to center the engine between the frame rails, the oil filter hits this cross member. Now, we can solve most of that problem by using a remote mounted oil filter. But we're probably gonna have to trim that cross member a little bit, so. We're gonna go ahead and mark it. Now, for your side-to-side -side measurements, ideally you want the engine centered in the frame rails, but you need to take into account your headers, your steering box, your starter, everything that mounts inside the frame rails, because these could dictate if you have to offset the engine a little bit. Now, if you remember right, I am using hydraulic steering on here, so I don't have a standard steering box. I'm using what is called a Charlin valve. You get these from the NOAC company. And basically, what you do is run lines from your power steering pump, they go to the valve, then you run lines out of the valve and down to your hydraulic cylinder, and then when you turn the steering wheel, it steers your tires just like a standard steering box. This is cool stuff. It's what all the monster trucks use, and if you're using hydraulic steering, you gotta have one. Now, if you'll notice, the way I have this mounted here, if I wanted to run headers down inside the frame rails, I'd have a problem because that is in the way. The only option I've got here is to run headers outside the frame rails. Now, if I took the Charlin valve and moved it down, mounted it down here, that would open up this area so I could make headers that would actually tuck down inside the frame rails. So you can see how important it is to mock everything up, to pre-plan everything, 
and to have all your components here when you're putting things together. Okay, at this point, you should have the engine all squared up and level between the frame rails and the firewall and the radiator. And as a general rule, it should be pitched back about three degrees to line up your drivetrain. But don't forget, your chassis also needs to be level. So you can see there is a lot going on here. And believe it or not, this is one of the trickiest things to do because the engine's gonna wanna move around on you as you're fine tuning it. So a cool trick is to go down to your local hardware store, pick up some of these cheap turnbuckles and some threaded rod and make yourself some adjustable mounts like this and put them on all four corners. Now this will allow you to fine tune the measurements of the engine until you get it exactly how you want it. Then when you get it there, they're not gonna move on you. Now you're ready to make your motor mounts and you got some choices, Let's take a look. Now, we've already established that you're not just gonna buy something and bolt it in. No, you're gonna have to make it. But that doesn't mean the aftermarket can't help you a little bit. One way to mount an engine is with a motor plate. Now, you can get these from Summit Racing. As you can see, they're cut for your specific engine. And basically, the way they mount is they bolt between the block and the water pump. Then you just come in and fabricate some sort of a mount that mounts them down on the frame. Now, guys have done this for years. A lot of racers do this. This is a great way to mount engines. The problem for us is it's gonna space our accessories out another three eighths of an inch toward the radiator. We can't afford to do that. So, no motor plate for us. Now, another option is to get some heavy duty link bars, suspension bars. We got these from Air Ride Technologies. They've got the rubber ends so they'll absorb vibration and we also got the brackets. Now look at this. That would make a great motor mount and they'd be adjustable and you can replace the end when they wear out. The problem is, we just don't have the room to mount something like this on the driver's side. So those are out. Option number three, <laughs> go down and get some universal hot rod motor mounts. Get these at Brookville Roadsters, pretty much any hot rod shop. They've got the rubber mount, the frame mount, and of course the engine mount. So what we're gonna do is mount this up as our frame mount, and then we'll just hand fabricate the part that goes to the engine. Hey, you're watching Gears, and today's show is about problem solving, fabrication, and building something to fit your particular application. Our subject is Sergeant Rock, and the 605 cubic inch big block that needs to go between the frame rails. So, how do you fit a modern engine into old frame rails? Check it out. We're already deep into it. Now, at this point, I know you're wondering about all these pieces and all these parts that I've been grinding and cutting on. Well, they're all part of a big puzzle. But on a project like this, you are not just putting a puzzle together. You're actually creating the puzzle as you go. So, whatever measurements you can do, whatever drawings you can do ahead of time to help you design something to fit your application is gonna help you pull off a successful project. All right, let's see how this stuff all fits together. Now. Cut these pieces out of quarter inch steel plate. This is the one that goes to the engine block. Then we have a base plate that'll go at a 90 degree angle. Then we have an upper plate that'll go at a 45 degree angle. Then we have this thick piece of tubing that I cut out of this rear suspension link. And it's gonna mount like this. And then it will all weld together to look like that. Now, let's go see how it fits. The mount simply bolts to the block and then it will bolt to the rubber mount that will weld to the frame. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, that's kind of a weird design there. Wouldn't it have been easier to do a bracket here, a bracket there, and some gussets and be done with it? Well, yeah, and that would have worked on the passenger side, but on the driver's side, I've got some other issues. Let's take a look. As you can see, the oil pump and the line going to it are a major problem because they are sitting right where a normal motor mount would want to go. Now, by designing the mounts the way we have, it allows the hose to run through the motor mount, but we still have great access to our mounting bolts, and these are going to be incredibly strong once I get them all finished up and gusseted.
Once everything is cleaned up, ground down and painted, here's what you've got. A very unique motor mount system that not only looks cool, but take a look at this. On the driver's side, the oil line comes right through the motor mount and we have great access to our bolts just like we originally planned. Also, notice I welded some gussets in down here, some up here and across the back. So these are incredibly strong, easily able to handle the power and torque that this engine's kicking out. Now, obviously, a project like this is very time consuming, takes a lot of effort, but it is something you need to know how to do because if you don't, you get two choices. You can either pay somebody a lot of money to do something like that for you, or you can just not do the project at all. <laughs> Neither one of those options is acceptable. And now, Parts Bin. If you are serious about off-roading, well, you know how important a real set of bumpers can be. The problem is, if you're driving an 80s or 90s Ford Bronco or F-Series pickup, you don't have a lot of options until now. This is the Extreme Duty Bumpers from Bronco Air, and these boys will get the job done. Check them out. As you can see, they have the pocket built right in for that all-important winch. You have D-ring hooks built in. You even have recessed lighting pockets for lighting down in the bumper. Then up here on top, you got tabs in the grill guard for even more lighting. Now, these things are made out of 316 steel, so they're very strong, and they've got all the support in the back. That's so if you take a shot here in the corner, these things aren't gonna fold up on you and make a big mess. Of course, they look good too. These things were designed and built to tuck right into the front of those trucks so they actually look like they belong there, not like some sort of an afterthought. Now, the rear bumper, just as important. As you can see, they did an awesome job on those too. You got D-ring hooks built in, receiver hitch, a place for a high lift jack, and the swing away spare tire carrier that will handle up to a 40 inch tall tire. <laughs> These guys aren't messing around. So if you're a four-wheeler, your vehicle of choice is a big Bronco, Bronco Air's got the bumpers to go on the truck. When it comes to getting tires for your truck or 4x4, the toughest decision you're going to face is what kind? <laughs> and that decision gets even tougher when you drive the truck every day but still want to go four-wheeling on the weekends. Well, Dick Cepec has got a solution to that dilemma with this FC2 radial tire. Now, as you can see for the off-road part, it's got big, aggressive lugs that are self-cleaning, so it's gonna get great traction in the sand or the mud. Then it's got the side biters on the sidewall, so you're gonna get extra strength and traction there. Then for the on-road part, you've got extra siping in the lugs, and of course, it's a radial design, so it's gonna run down the road really well, and it's a high mileage tread, so it's gonna last a long time. So if you're looking for a great hybrid tire that's not too rough, not too smooth, Dixie Peck's got the tire that's just right. You know, everybody knows how important the wheels are to the look and the attitude of your vehicle. But there's another wheel out there that's just as important people don't talk about near as much, the steering wheel. And nobody offers you more options than Grant. For example, you can get the classic hot rod wheel with a small diameter and the black wrapping. They have a more fancy designer style wheel with more billet aluminum and leather wrapping and very unique horn buttons. They've also got a series that looks just like a classic 60s muscle car wheel with the brush spokes and the little tiny horn button. Also, you can get all kinds of adapters to adapt these wheels to just about any steering column out there. So, it doesn't matter if you're working on a 4x4 or a custom or a hot rod or a muscle car. Hopefully, you're going to have your hands wrapped around a wheel for a long time. You might as well make sure it's something cool. Grant can help you do that. And now, what are you working on? Brought to you by Phoenix Systems Brake Tools. Record-breaking performance that you can feel. Today's What Are You Working On comes from Rick Johnson from Tacoma, Washington, and his project is a CJ3B Jeep. But this is not your typical project. This is not a restoration. 
Rick actually hand built this Jeep from the ground up. Now, if you don't believe me, take a look at this picture. This is Rick and a buddy laying out the plans for his Jeep on the kitchen floor. Now, if you'll take a look at this next picture, you notice the plans are hanging up on the wall, and he is actually building the chassis in the foreground. Now, notice that the frame is all hand built. He's got his link bars laid out. He's got nine inch Ford axles front and rear. He's really doing a nice job on this. Now, this thing is running a 302 Ford motor. It's got a C6 transmission that he got out of the paper. He got the 205 transfer case from a junkyard and he put this whole thing together. This is hand built at its best. Now, the body is fiberglass. Check it out. He built it from some molds that he got from a friend of his. Now, one of the key statements here, he said his wife at the time said that this was a waste of money and this thing would never run down the road. Well, obviously, she was wrong because here's a shot of Rick driving it down the road. From what it sounds like, he probably sent her down the road too, which was probably not a bad thing. You don't mess with a guy in his Jeep. Now, Rick, we got a surprise for you. We hooked up with Phoenix Systems and we are gonna give you a brake bleeder system and some brake strips and some tools to help you service your brakes. The rest of you guys, if you want something like this, you gotta send some things in to GearsTV.com. We're out of time. We will see you next week. <laughs> All right.